All right, uh, we are here looking at chapter 14. We're talking about uh, worker safety um, out of the broad umbrella of risk management. So let's let's get into it. So number one, just a definition of risk management. involves the responsibility to consider physical, human, and financial factors protecting an organizational individual interests. Kind of a, a broad term, uh, but it's brought on purpose because there's a lot of stuff that kind of fits onto it from wellness programs to health promotion, um, to safety, to OSHA, ADA, etc. So let's unpack some of it. Uh, first, a little bit of, a little bit of data. So uh, one in four employees report being harassed or threatened or attacked at work. It's 25 percent. Two million crimes committed at work each year. Uh, that shouldn't shock us. If people spend uh, 40 or 50 hours a week at work. 16 percent of assaults, and this one's kind of weird. Workplace homicide victims are 80 percent male, which means if someone's going to kill somebody at work, 80% of the time, the person they kill is a man. However, it is the leading occupational death, cause of occupational death among women. So if you are a woman and you die at work, um, the number one way that you die is somebody kills you, and that's pretty freaking weird. So why do we, why do we look at stuff like this? We look for trends. We look for propensities um, from, a, from a, a kind of a director level or an HR uh, perspective. So most, uh, most common jobs experiencing homicide, cab driver, security guards, you can read it. So when we see stuff like this, that's when we pause and we go, okay, what's the theme or what do we have in common? Um, so in this case, you may look at it and go, well, this, those seem kind of obscure, but they have two things in common. Number one, they're open to the public. Number two, they're open at night. Um, so, so whenever we see those kinds of trends, we go, okay, that's interesting. Um, do I have anything in my firm? For instance, this would be just an example that's open to the public and open at night. Um, and then we take different kinds of precautions. That's what I mean by kind of an environmental scan to see what, are the, what does the data say? What are the trajectories? What are the propensities? Um, and then what do we need to do about it from a health perspective? So three main areas that we talk about in risk management. One of them is health and then safety and then security. So health is a general state of physical, mental, and emotional well-being. Um, it's very broad. It's very broad on purpose. And we'll get to a law here in a little bit called OSHA, which is a thing called the General Duty Clause, which means, in general, organizations have the duty or the responsibility to make sure that their employees are in a safe and healthy work environment. So very broad. Number two, safety. That's when we're really looking at physical stuff. We start to take a look at... Um, personal protective equipment, how we're training people to use machines, uh, stuff like that. And then security. Security is uh, becoming even more broad with the uh, threat of uh, cyber terrorism. Um, so people aren't breaking in, people still break into organizations, but a new way to break in uh, obviously is um, through uh, cyber threats. So big legal concerns, when we look at this at kind of a base level of kind of taking care of our business, we have workers' compensation. Uh, if you get hurt on the job, uh, you get money to get back on your feet. Uh, Americans with Disabil Disabilities Act, we'll look at this a little bit. This is when somebody gets, uh, we usually think about this in terms of, hey, don't discriminate against somebody who has a disability. Yes, that's true, but what happens as related to safety is people get hurt and actually become disabled on the job. So what do we do with, in that situation? Uh, child labor laws, we'll look at that. Um, different types of civil rights laws and a little bit, very little bit on collective bargaining, which is unions. So first, the ADA. Um, one thing that, that we, this is a common mistake that people do is you have an employee and um, they're good and they get hurt and you want to bring them back to work. And so, so people have heard of this term called light duty. Can they return to work light duty? Um, so we return people to work often because they want to and um, and even if they're not quite ready and we say well we'll kind of ease them into it as they get healthy one of the challenges with that is we undercut what are called the essential job functions in the job um, and that is you have to do these three or four kind of main things think 20 percent or more on average uh, these are main chunks of the job so if I got hurt on the job and I couldn't talk um, you might say oh well we'll bring him back to work as a professor um, but the challenge is, can he still do the job? You know, someone can get hurt and disabled and they're no longer qualified to do the job. So we got to um, not return people to work until they can at least do the essential job functions on the job. Uh, regarding child labor law, there's a, there's a type of work called hazardous work. Um, it's coded by the Department of Labor, mining, railway, stuff like that. 
um, and there's you have to be 18 years old or older to do it, stuff like that. So th there is breakdowns, but I want you to hold this loosely because each state, Washington State specifically, but each state um, uh, has their own child labor laws, things that people can and can't do at certain ages. This is kind of general um, at a at kind of a federal or overall level. In general, when you're 16, you can start working. If you're uh, certain hours a day, especially during during school time, um, 14 and 15 is very limited. Okay, um, legal issues regarding work assignments. So uh, a couple things on this. One of them, obviously, you can see reproductive health. So if a woman is pregnant and uh, works in, we had a case that was in the paint hanger uh, at Boeing, and says, I, I don't want to do this job right now. I'm concerned for whatever it is, baby birth defects. Um, number one, that is on us as a company uh, to be concerned about reproductive health. Now, it doesn't mean we go around to everybody and say, hey, are you pregnant? Do you have plans to get pregnant? But make accommodations um, uh, when we know or should have known. But the second point there is is pretty important that employees, if employees feel like the work is unsafe, they can actually refuse to do it. I was on a consulting project recently where somebody was hanging by um, cables down in a hole and the person is like, no, like I don't trust that person um, because of some things that they had learned about them to hold me on those cables to operate the equipment so I'm not going to do it. Um, and the organization has to respect and honor that and make it safe. Um, doesn't mean they have to do whatever the employee wants but they just have to make sure that it is in fact um, safe. And this falls under a very broad law came around 1970 called the Occupational Safety and Health Act which is overseen by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So it's not kind of a trick question if someone says, uh, what does OSHA stand for? Well, it's got two. One of them is the act and the other one is the administration that oversees the act. Um, so it's very, it's very broad uh, in its scope. Um, so basically OSHA enforces, OSHA the administration enforces the safety regulations that are in the act. There's a lot of components to it. We'll look at a few of them. But the big idea is probably the general duty clause, which means in whatever it is, service manufacturing, no matter where you are, uh, employers have a responsibility to make sure it's a safe and healthy um, work environment. This is some data since 2004, uh, specifically workplace fatalities. And people might point to this and say, hey, look, OSHA is actually working. We are making the workplace uh, more safer. You can see there was a big drop there up to 2008-2009 that kind of kind of leveled out. Um, oh, this is uh, OSHA is also it's kind of weird but it's related to uh, unions and union laws as well uh, in that unions are, are usually they have a heavier presence in the manufacturing sector where you're more likely to see accidents certainly uh, workplace fatalities and um, and people would argue maybe there's less of a need for unions now because of laws like this because of the Occupational Safety and Health Act, um, which is put in there for workers. So, um, what does OSHA cover? It's got a few things. Number one of them is how they enforce their laws, uh, which can include in inspections, surprise visits even. Uh, another one is hazard communication. If you're ever walking down the hall, somebody mopped the floor and there's a sign up, you know, it says caution, floor is wet. That's an OSHA issue. Um, or instructions next to a fire extinguisher, that's an OSHA issue. You have to communicate where there's a potential hazard. Uh, Bloodborne pathogens, um, gloves, masks, stuff like that. Uh, basically, a way to respond in case of an accident to minimize the risk of um, bloodborne pathogens. The next one is personal protective equipment. There's different, you know, I've got a video link there, but there's different things on this. But this is when you think of, uh, like, I, I, my mind goes to a construction site. Someone wearing a hard hat or steel toe boots or gloves, uh, or if somebody is is uh, working with wood they're going to use uh, eye protection stuff like that so those are the things that say you no know, you have to you have to wear these uh, to protect you it sounds uh, maybe odd but a lot of workers often will say well I don't want to it's inconvenient to wear the goggles they fog up or inconvenient to wear the gloves because I can't you know pick up things that I want to pick up uh, small uh, kind of fine things um, again it's on us if we if we train someone and we um, tell them about personal protective equipment, make it available to them, and they don't do it, um, and they get injured, that still comes back to us as the organization, um, both, there's a, there's a moral component there, somebody got hurt, but also a legal component, um, and pandemic guidelines. What do we do with things like coronavirus or SARS or whatever when it's going out? So OSHA has a, 
has this this concept of recordability and and it produces what's called the incident rate. So how many how many people do you have? How many incidents have you had per year? And it's kind of a weird a weird game that safety managers feel like they have to play. Um, and that is if I record a lot all my cases, my incident rate goes really high and it looks like it's an unsafe work environment. If I don't record the cases, I'm in violation of OSHA and could get uh, fined or worse. Um, so this is just kind of a, a guide to know when you need to record. When I say record a case, I mean like, here's what happened. Um, here was the accident. We did a root cause analysis and we found out this was the issue. And then these are the changes that we made, training, equipment, whatever, uh, to try to prevent that accident from happening again. Um, so that's that's what I mean by when you record a case. You just document that it happened and, and kind of what the, what the cause was and what you did about it. So... Uh, if somebody dies at work, you're going to have to write that down, right? I think we got that. If somebody gets sick at work because of something at work, you're going to have to write that down. Um, if somebody blows out their ACL playing flag football on the weekend and they lump, limp into work on crutches, you don't have to write that down. It wasn't a workplace issue. Most of the complexity revolves around when someone gets hurt at work, kind of how bad is it before we have to document it. So... Uh, if they have to transfer to another job, they lose consciousness, restriction of motion, something like that, you got to document those. Medical treatment, stitches, something like that, you document those. If it's like I, I got a paper cut, you don't you don't have to document that. Uh, if no first aid was done, you don't have to document that. For the most part, like when in doubt, write it down, root cause analysis, figure out what happened, and figure out um, how to prevent it from happening again if you can. So OSHA inspections, the Occupational Safety and Health Act has got a board of um, inspectors and they they will show up at your company for one of two reasons well maybe one of three reasons number one you have a spike in your incident rate meaning it's getting worse they might show up uh, number two um, you're a big company and they can affect a lot of people so you'll find a lot of OSHA inspections at you know Amazon Costco Walmart stuff like that because if they can make a change it can impact and help a lot of people because it's a large organization, just straight in size. Um, but the third reason, and probably the most common reason that you have an OSHA inspection, the surprise OSHA inspection, um, would be that somebody made a call. Um, so and I think this is probably known at this point, um, but if employees make a call to OSHA, an accusation, think of it like they're making a call to the EEOC, making an accusation, the same retaliation principles apply. We cannot retaliate against an employee. Hey, you called the government on us, you know, I thought you were on our team, etc. Nope, they have the absolute freedom and right to do that um, and no retaliation against them accordingly, otherwise, um, otherwise there are legal consequences. So, someone comes to the door for an inspection, uh, you can ask for the credentials, that's fine. Uh, initially, you can, even, you can even decline if you want to. I don't recommend it. Um, I use the analogy of, of I review papers, right, academic papers for, for publication. My, my job, my eye, and my mind is trained to find problems in papers. Weak arguments, poor citations, um, uh, statistical errors, stuff like that. So with any paper, um, I can find something wrong, and, and that's just that's just my eye was trained for. Safety inspectors are the same thing. They can walk into any company and find something wrong. And if you deny them at the door, force them to go get a warrant to show up, Chances are they're going to find a lot, of, a lot of things wrong, and it's not going to go well for you. Um, so, so my experience with uh, with OSHA investigations has been fine. People come up and say, "Yeah, it's great." Well, let's walk around, show me what you see, and 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 kind of partner with them. I've heard horror stories uh, when they're particularly angry, I, but I haven't experienced that um, myself. So, an inspection is there? Yes, it is legal. Yes, they do have the authority to do it. Um, and if they find things, they may cite you. So if there are uh, four different citations, um, well, sort of five different citations you can get. One of them is called imminent danger. That's the worst. That means someone's about to die. Um, you're going to get cited for that. You're probably going to get fined for that. Uh, the next one down is serious. It means, hey, like like somebody could get really hurt here. Um, chances are you will probably be cited for that as well. There's one called other than serious. Uh, impact in police health or safety. Um, but it probably wouldn't really maim somebody or kill somebody. Um, you may or may not get cited for that. When I say cited, I mean fined. You'll certainly 
get a you know get a violation, get a write up that you'll need to deal with. Um, so that the top one is imminent danger, kind of works its way down uh, to the last one being de minimis. It means because not a big deal, but hey, as soon as you get a chance, get over there and uh, and take care of whatever the issue is. No doors in the bathroom stalls, I mean whatever. There's a weird category that can affect any of them, and that's called willful and repeated. It means uh, uh, an ocean inspector showed up to my job site and people weren't wearing hard hats and they were operating, you know, under someone laying bricks or something. Um, and they say, hey, that could that could really mess somebody up. Uh, we're going to cite you for that and get it fixed. And then they come back a week later and the same thing is happening. It means it's willful. You knew better and you did it anyway and it's repeated. This is the same thing more than once. Those almost always incur a pretty significant uh, financial penalty and I'm not taking care of civil penalty as well. Okay, when there is an accident, uh, what is kind of the, the recognized protocol to respond to it? Um, so we'll do this in class sometimes. I'll say, okay, if you go in factory floor and, and somebody is, is bleeding, you know, from their arm, it, it's bad, um, what do you do? And they're like, well, we call 911 um, and, and then we, uh, you know, ask the person if they're okay. I'm like, yeah, sort of. The first thing you do is you stop and you look and go, what caused this? and you unplug the freaking machine like like whatever the threat is neutralize the threat immediately then go to the person right form first aid if you can call 911 etc um, you also want to take a quick look around the room the idea is who saw this because um, we're going to need to do an investigation and we want to know what happened how this person got hurt so um, neutralize the threat attend to the person and as you're attending to the person be like okay you 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 go to whatever, three different offices. Don't let them hang out. Don't put them in a room. Think of it like you're conducting an investigation, an EEO investigation. Like ever watch, you know, CSI, you know, on TV or something like that. You want to separate the witnesses. Otherwise, they begin talking um, and then the stories begin to change. And you want you want independent verification. You figure out what happened. Uh, I said identify kind of a root cause analysis. What was what was the problem here? Um, and then you may uh, you may want to do a drug test to the person if there's um, if there's suspicion. Uh, under reasonable suspicion or in cases of accidents are two common ways that we do that um, and then you figure out figure out how to solve the problem make sure it doesn't happen again so just uh, just to, to restate one of the things that people forget to do is neutralize the threat so you're over there working with someone giving them first aid and then somebody else gets hurt so that be that would be the first thing I mentioned uh, uh, drug tests this is kind of interesting in states like Washington and Colorado with new marijuana laws. Um, but when we're talking about substance abuse, think about something broader. Someone showing up, you know, high on heroin, crack, something like that. We'll deal with, with marijuana here as well. Um, but the use of illicit substances and the, uh, or the misuse of controlled substances. So people addicted to prescription drugs, um, alcohol, stuff like that, affecting the workplace. There's a lot of different ways that we can test for that. Your analysis are about 95% accurate. There are ways to dupe them through um, dilution and adulterants. It's about an extra $5 to test for those. So some people say, oh, if you take this, you'll pass your analysis. Yes, we can test for that. You know, we're pretty good, at, pretty good at chemistry at this point. Radio immune assay of hair. This is uh, not done very often, and it wouldn't be helpful for someone like me, short hair going bald. Um, the advantage is the accuracy rate's about the same, maybe a little less than a urinalysis, um, but the advantage is time. So, um, for instance, if you have long hair, um, as long as you've had your hair, uh, they can actually tease out uh, drugs in your hair. So, yeah, I did um, whatever, meth, you know, four years ago. Well, if I've had that same hair, then, then it can be found. Uh, surface swiping, you can do that. Fitness for duty tests. Usually we do that for alcohol, but they're not particularly accurate. Um, it's a lot of subjective judgment uh, kind of involved in it. So common signs of substance abuse. I love uh, I love seeing these types of charts because I look at it and go fatigue, uh, slurred speech, tiredness. I'm thinking like that's a common sign of being a parent too. So um, <laughs> your your judgment on this uh, will matter. But we don't go just off of this. This Some of these things might be enough to create what's called reasonable suspicion. Um, and you can say, okay, go get a drug test. Um, and if they refuse, then you consider it as a failed drug test. That'll be in your policy manual. At least it should be. Um, but but this alone isn't, this isn't conviction. This is really loose evidence. You're going to want a, a, an actual chemical drug test. Um, this is what you might might look for. Someone's 
in an accident um, and they've they've displayed these behaviors over the last week or two you're like all right yeah we're gonna we're gonna drug test here uh, from a security perspective uh, one of the things that we think about is um, like violence there's obviously uh, active shooter training available uh, many uh, local precincts like uh, police officers will actually come into organizations many times for free and even give uh, active shooter training so it's a good thing um, it's a good thing to do to take advantage of if you would like to do that um, but a big thing on this is is kind of anticipation right usually what happens uh, with a violent employee is there's 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 kind of a trajectory of behavior and a defensiveness and an escalation but there, there's like a, a jolt or a trigger moment um, usually it's something at home it's a fight with a kid it's a divorce it's a bankruptcy it's something and then that spills over into work so that's the, those are the kind of things that that we that we we look for in kind of an anticipation to shut it down more quickly um, if we can other things we can see this isn't necessarily violence but workplace incivility bullying uh, stuff like that this is um, it's gonna happen I think in the future more than it happens now but remember under OSHA there is a general duty clause that there's a healthy work environment remember the definition of health includes emotional well-being so I think we'll probably see a time when like bully managers or abusive managers becomes a violation of OSHA um, that's kind of creeping up now there's more awareness of things like bullying and cyberbullying after high school campaigns once those workers hit the workforce they'll be salient to it they'll they'll recognize it um, so I think this is coming more uh, in the meantime it's something that HR people think about in terms of if we're architecting a culture and we have incivility and bullying then we need to deal with that um, some of that can be done through selection batteries as well hiring for, hiring for personality traits um, so anyway well uh, I was mentioning on workplace violence what we're looking for is like a like a trajectory once we start hitting uh, level one a lot of that can be personality once we start hitting level two we go okay now we're talking about threats that's a little different um, then of course level three um, need to engage quickly some other things on workplace security so disaster preparation recovering I remember uh, I was at Boeing and there was an earthquake and uh, everybody's like getting under their desk and getting in doorways and I'm like whatever peace out I was in a big concrete building so I hit the stairs booked it out of there ran out to the parking lot and saw the the light poles like squeaking back and forth and then it stopped and I'm looking around going well, I ain't going back in got my car and drove home um, thought it was great got a call that evening from my senior manager in a panic because I didn't meet at the rendezvous place which was the uh, the disaster escape we all met there except James so like oh well James maybe is dead in the building somewhere no James just left uh, so so it's good to have these things but that was a, a fun reminder to say it's also good to train employees on these things uh, so what do we do if we have hazard materials and and they begin to leak we need to contain them um, is there somebody there who's certified in first aid or, or CPR um, how do we contact people after the after a case of a disaster stuff like that so we document it we build a plan and that's part of employees orientation uh, when they come on board so they're aware of it um, this is this is kind of interesting so uh, right now um, it seems like every couple of years there's a new strain of flu, pig flu, swine flu, SARS, coronavirus, whatever, that freaks somebody out um, and, and hurts a lot of people. And we think about, okay, at what point would we say don't come to work? At what point would we suspend operations? Um, and for the operations manager who wears a mask, they say, oh, well, never because there's work to be done. Well, no, because you endanger employees. Um, there's not only a, a, a human and a moral component to that but there's also a business component to that if all your employees get sick um, or people begin to die because you expose them to something so there isn't like like general rules on this other than this needs to be on the radar screen there has to be a a, a mark of okay when this happens we say everybody stay home we're going to suspend operations um, until whatever it is um, passes so I know that was a that was a lot and a little bit of out of time but um, Big ideas under the umbrella of risk management.